When blast crumbles a home like this, there are bound to be casualties. People are trapped, possibly unconscious. Some are injured. All of them may be suffering from shock. Those who are not seriously injured will try to pick their way out of the wreckage. But for all, there will be help from the Civil Defense Rescue Service, parties of men trained and mobile whose duty is to find and extricate the casualties. The damage control officer and the local warden are on the scene at once. The warden knows the families of his district intimately. He helps in any way he can until the rescue party begins work. The leader of the party is completely responsible for the rescue operation. Under him are a deputy leader and six other men. The damage control officer who represents the area controller calls whatever services are needed to the incident. He gives the rescue party leader the time of the explosion, the kind of blast, the special hazards to be aware of. Once casualties have received first aid treatment for shock, they may be questioned. For gathering information is the first duty. The warden helps the leader with a copy of the household register. The Brennan family lived here. James Brennan, his wife, their daughter Edna, and their son Robert. The leader keeps his own record of the names. All of them will have to be accounted for before the rescue party leaves the site. The leader also notes other details that may help in the search. It's useful to know of any small children in the house and places where people might have been at the time of the explosion. A workshop, for example, or the bedroom of a man who works night shift and sleeps days. Compared with the warden's diagram of the house, the wreckage appears chaotic and hopeless. It doesn't look much like the neat diagram now, but this is no time to lose one's head. A calm, organized approach to the problem will do a great deal to solve it. When the leader has sufficient information, he orders his deputy to begin a surface search around the house. But he himself will question anyone who can tell him where members of the family were at the time of the explosion. Edna Brennan, the first casualty out, remembers her father was papering the living room at the far side of the house. This information is something else to note. And though collecting information may seem to delay the rescue, it always speeds it in the long run. Time spent in reconnaissance is seldom wasted. Edna thinks her brother went to his friend's house. But information from a casualty is not always reliable, so the warden will try to verify it. But whether the statement is entirely reliable or not, it must be noted carefully. Every casualty is tagged. Name, place found, injuries, and first aid given are marked on it. And the leader keeps his own record. At some accessible place near the incident, the damage control officer establishes an ambulance point. All casualties are brought here. The surface search for casualties who may be on the fringe of the incident is the first stage of the rescue operation. But others may still be making their own way out of the house. It sometimes happens that they recover from the first effects of the blast and in stumbling through the rubble they'll be heard by the surface searchers.
Rescue men crawl on the rubble as little as possible. When they must, they're cautious. And they must be cautious too when they find someone in a dangerous position, such as under a brick wall that might topple at any moment. An emergency rescue must be undertaken. The wall can be shored up with loose timber from the house, and all the necessary tools will be found in the truck. During an incident, it's the truck driver's job to look after the tools for the rescue party, checking them in and out. The leader must always be notified of any rescue operation in progress. Having gathered all the information he can, the leader must make a reconnaissance of the collapsed house to see how the whole rescue problem can best be attacked. He must form a systematic plan to get all the casualties out as quickly as possible. The deputy leader is competent to carry out the emergency rescue, while the leader himself looks ahead to the next stage of his work. A ladder forms a good bridge over rubble, which shouldn't be trampled too much in case it conceals casualties. This tangled wreckage, once the main part of the ground floor, must now be searched. From his talk with Edna, the leader learned Mr. Brennan might be there. This is a good time to begin a search for him. Getting near to the heart of the incident to find people who may be seen or heard is the second stage of the rescue operation. It can proceed even while fringe casualties are still being found and taken care of. The leader continues his reconnaissance and decides where his party might look next. He must decide where casualties may be and how the rescuers might get to them. Here the collapsed floors have formed voids or protected spaces which will have to be explored. At the far end of the basement there's a workshop. Upstairs part of the floor has fallen but there are bedrooms to search and there is evidence that someone might have been upstairs house cleaning. A rescue man could be sent at once, but the stairs are destroyed and there's no easy way up inside the house. For the time being, one man will begin a basement search. After the surface casualties are cleared and more men become available, all parts of the house can be explored and a man can be sent upstairs by ladder Not all casualties belong to the household. They may be repairmen or friends in the house at the time of the explosion. His wallet identifies this young man, Donald Wilkinson. When surface casualties are all taken to the ambulance point, the rescue party engages in a methodical search of the whole house. One man begins to look through the relatively clear sections of the basement. But inside it's dark and difficult to get through. By ladder, another man makes his way upstairs. Part of the floor has fallen, and he'll have to stay close to the walls for safety while searching the bedrooms. 
for people often take shelter under beds or tables during an air raid. On what used to be the ground floor, where the wreckage is precarious, the rescuers move carefully to avoid further collapses, watching and listening for trapped casualties. Two men usually go in together, so that one can stay with an injured person and give him immediate first aid, while the other goes for the stretcher and any necessary equipment. Mr. Brennan is found. Searches continue simultaneously in different parts of the house. Saws and tools indicate the basement room that was used as a workshop. Bricks, furniture, rubble and twisted pipes will block off whole parts of the basement and the searcher must be careful to avoid causing serious collapses. Upstairs, the doorway to a bedroom is blocked. Breaking through may be difficult and dangerous. Sometimes it's easier and safer to get in over a wall. For an injured person, the stretcher ride out of the house can be painful. The patient is blanketed to keep him warm, giving his back special protection. Warmth reduces the effects of shock and the rescue men will move as smoothly as they can to ease his journey. The attic provides a way into the blocked upstairs bedroom where the deputy leader finds a casualty. Mrs. Brennan, unconscious. It would be difficult to carry her down inside the house. A ladder rescue can therefore be tried. Yet one casualty, no matter how urgent, must not divert the leader from his general plan. Collecting and checking information must go on. The warden, who asked the neighbors about the boys, makes his report to the leader. People in nearby houses said they saw Robert Brennan and his friend Eric Henderson coming back before the bombs fell. It's no easy job carrying a stretcher over rubble. Without special care in handling, the casualty gets a jolting ride which might aggravate his pain. One good way is to use several men, passing the stretcher from hand to hand. Checking the casualty's tag, the leader marks Mr. Brennan's name and injury in his notebook, keeping his own records up to date. He loses no chance to check on the other people who may have been in the house. Has Mr. Brennan seen anything of the boys? Though members of the household may not have seen the missing people, the leader can't assume that they weren't there at the time of the blast. Every possible place where they could have been must be explored. Right. 
If no trace is found in the relatively clear parts of the basement, the voids formed by the collapsed floors are a possibility. And this is the third stage of rescue, the exploration of places where people could be trapped and injured and remain alive. Whenever possible, another man stands by while a void is searched. Meanwhile, as many men as can be spared will be needed for the ladder rescue. A casualty to be moved from a difficult place is tied to the stretcher. The system used by the rescue party will hold the person firm and safe, no matter how the stretcher is tilted. Ropes or guys are attached to the stretcher to ease it down a little at a time. And one man is on the ladder to take some of the weight. Now, Mrs. Brennan, her husband, their daughter Edna, and Donald Wilkinson, a surface casualty, have been rescued. The void at the rear of the house is empty. The leader, therefore, orders the second man to search the front one. Voids like this are often made when floors collapse, pivoting at a strong point, such as a wall, and supporting the wreckage above. When the early stages of the rescue operation have failed to turn out all the missing people, it's the task of the rescue party to explore places where someone may be buried with little chance of being alive. This is the fourth stage of rescue. Rubble-filled corners, which might conceal casualties, may have to be stripped clear. And the rescuers may have to dig their way into rooms blocked by bricks and wreckage. Eric Henderson's mother knows the boys came back. It's natural for her to want to find her son. But normal people can become hysterical under stress, and they only endanger themselves and others when they crawl in the debris. The leader tells her there are a number of places the rescuers can look. They're trained and they'll search systematically. She is hindering them and must be made to leave. The likeliest places to search are the pile of rubble and the blocked room. The leader decides to search the room first. Someone might stand a better chance of being alive there and afterwards the rubble pile in the corner. Mrs. Henderson will be looked after by a welfare worker from the Advance Information Welfare Post, while the rescue party finds another way into the room. The plan of the house shows a basement window, somewhere under a mass of brick and rubble. But before clearing it, there's a way to be assured someone is there, and if so, where he is located. This is the technique of calling and listening. Natural conductors like pipes and holes in the rubble will help carry the sound of voices. The call is rescue party here. Can you hear me? Such a call means help is at hand and does much to encourage a casualty.
It may be necessary to call a number of times. When a contact is established, the leader takes over the questioning. The voice is faint. It's Robert. He says he's pinned under a beam, but he's all right. Asked if Eric is with him, he mentions a bicycle at the side of the house. The direction of Robert's position is now pinpointed by checking the other rescuers, and the leader and one man will explore the rubble at the side of the house while the basement window is being cleared. The search for Eric is an example of the fifth stage of rescue, the stripping of debris in selected locations until everyone has been accounted for. A bicycle reflector is the clue where to look. A bicycle wheel, a foot. The leg severed in the great crush of brick and rock that engulfed Eric Henderson as he waited for his friend. There's little hope for him. The site will be cleared and his body will be taken away afterward. Meanwhile, the window is cleared of rubble and the rest of the party are bent on finding Robert. But a basement rescue has many hazards, escaping gas, broken water mains and live electric wires. Special equipment is needed for Robert Brennan's rescue. The rescue truck carries three jacks of various capacities, ideal tools to raise beams, walls and floors enough to release a trapped casualty. Before he is released, however, the casualty crushed by wreckage must drink at least a pint of fluid. This is a medical necessity. A mixture of water and bicarbonate of soda is best and the rescue truck will have a supply of it. If he doesn't like the taste, the patient may need a little encouragement to help him get it down. But get it down he must. At last, the beam is jacked up enough to allow Robert to be moved. The leader orders him tied to a stretcher, and the lad will soon be out. When a casualty is to be taken out through a narrow opening, there should be many hands at the other side to receive the stretcher. All the occupants of the Brennan home have now been accounted for. The leader's list is checked, the last of the names marked off. When this is done, there is still another important duty. Marking the house to tell parties who might follow on the scene what has been done. 
The sign means the house has been searched by rescue party and is dangerous property. The men gather their equipment, stretchers and tools and store them in the truck before leaving the site to return to their action stations. The warden and the leader make one last check of their notes to make certain the incident is entirely cleared. Later, the leader will report to the damage control officer. But now the crew must line up and number off as a check that no one has been left behind. The incident, though not a major one, is closed. But an efficient, well-trained civil defense rescue service inspires confidence that larger emergencies can be met. <laughs>